Once you start talking about rotation, it's pretty natural to want to know what is the kinetic energy associated with different kinds of rotation. And that's what this movie is going to talk about. But at the same time, we're going to run into this really important concept called rotational inertia, or sometimes called the moment of inertia. And um, so the movie really is about kinetic energy of rotation, but also this idea of rotational inertia. So let's uh, send the cat's head spinning, and you can see that there's a rotation happening there. And um, what would it mean to calculate the kinetic energy of the spinning cat's head? Well, um, one way to think about this is to start uh, breaking the cat's head up into little tiny pieces and to say, all right, well, let me find the kinetic energy of that little piece. And I could also find the kinetic energy of that little piece. And then I can keep going, finding the kinetic energy of all the little pieces and then adding all of those little bits of kinetic energy together. And that seems like it would be a pretty reasonable way of calculating kinetic energy. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So each of the little bits will have its own kinetic energy that I'm calling Ke sub i here. And uh, they'll all have a mass, m, I, m sub i, and a velocity, v sub i. So the kinetic energy of a little bit of the cat's head is 1 half m i v i squared. Of course, it's really important to note that um, we still know that this relationship is true, that for any given piece, the velocity is equal to the rotational velocity of the cat's head times the radius or the distance from the axis of rotation to that little bit. And for all of the pieces, the green piece, the orange piece, and all of the other pieces, omega is the same because it takes all of them the same amount of time to make one lap. Um, but the velocity of those pieces, well, those velocities are not the same. The orange bit will not have the same linear speed as the green bit. It will be going around, um, well, its linear speed will be uh, smaller than the linear speed of the green piece. So we're going to take advantage of this idea. And um, what we're going to do next is say, OK, so the kinetic energy of the entire cat head will be the sum of all of the kinetic energies of the various pieces of the cat's head. Um, and then we can take advantage of the vi equals omega ri relationship and just plug it right in here. And um, then this gives us a formula that might look more complicated, but actually the um, omega can be pulled out of there so that we can rewrite it um, in this way. And now we have something that, believe it or not, looks kind of like the kinetic energy that we're used to. There's a one-half term out in front. And if you remember uh, what the kinetic energy was for an, um, an object moving in a straight line, it's one-half mv squared, right? So we have one-half out front, and we have a kind of v on the far side. Omega is the angular velocity, so we have one-half something times omega squared. And so what we typically do is we take this something and we rename it. We say, well, let's call that, um, you could call it whatever you want. We happen to call it in physics the rotational inertia or the moment iner of inertia. Um, and we tend to, to use the symbol I in order to indicate this, this rotational inertia. And um, when we do that, we can rewrite kinetic energy as one-half i omega squared, which is something that looks simple, and it looks really sim uh, similar to the kinetic energy that you're familiar with for linear motion. It's just the rotational equivalent of kinetic energy, so one-half i omega squared. Meanwhile, this i thing is a little bit weird, and we have to think about it some more, but that is the rotational um, analog of mass or inertia, and so it's quite appropriate that it would be referred to as rotational inertia. All right, so let's do some examples now so you can get a better feel for what this rotational inertia is all about. So let's say that you have a pencil. If you have a pencil at home, you can even just pick one up and try this out yourself. And you decide to rotate it around its center of mass. Well, how does that feel? It's not super difficult to do that. If you then move your fingers down to the eraser of the pencil and try to move it around, 
you will find that it's actually more difficult to get the pencil started and stopped when your fingers are at the eraser end than, we're at, than, we're, than when they are at the middle of the pencil. And the reason for that goes back to this rotational inertia formula. If you look at this um, formula, well, you can imagine breaking the pencil up into lots of little pieces and then just ask yourself, how is the mass distributed when, you're, when you are rotating about the eraser? Well, you can see that down near the tip of the pencil, uh, the mass down there is at quite a large radius from the eraser. The stuff near the eraser is, of course, at a quite a small radius. But if you have the uh, axis of rotation at the eraser end, there are, there's, there's a bunch of mass that's far away, has big R. And so you get a relatively larger number for the rotational inertia than you do when you have the axis of rotation at the center of the pencil. And so numerically, it seems that you have a larger rotational inertia when you rotate the pencil around the eraser. But also, um, there's a physical meaning to this. It's harder to get the pencil uh, to rotate. So if we wanted to actually go about finding the rotational inertia of the pencil, you could imagine saying, all right, well, let me um, think about one of these little masses and um, I'll call that m sub i, and here's the radius, r sub i, and if I, um, if I look at all the, the little bits of mass and uh, figure out how far they are away from the eraser, I can, uh, for each m sub i, I'll get a m i r i squared, I can add all of those together and that's going to give me um, the rotational inertia of the pencil. The thing is, if we do this well, we should make the little masses so small that they almost go down to nothing. And so what we're really going to want to do is take an integral. And so there's an integral form for the rotational inertia equation that looks like this, r squared dm. And uh, in later movies, I will take a couple of examples and show you how to use that integral formula. But um, I should just say that when we do, we will, instead of referring to little bits of mass as mi's, we'll refer to them as dm's. And the distance from the axis of rotation to any one of those dm's will be referred to as r.